Lord Jesus, I just thank you for your Holy Spirit that resides within each and every one of us as your children and believers. And I would ask, Lord, that through your Spirit, through the conviction of your Holy Spirit, that you would lead us into truth and into leaning in to learn, Lord, and to be humble in our hearts and in our minds to be taught by your word so that through your sanctification we could in your grace and in your mercy become more like your son Jesus. We ask this Lord in Jesus name and we commit this night to you and everything that we do in our fellowship and in this time of teaching and we ask that you bless it. Amen. Amen. So as we know our scripture is Galatians 5, we should know this off by heart, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Again, such things there is no law. And we really have been on an amazing journey at the start of the year, um, you know, going through all these different attributes, knowing that it is the one fruit, but many attributes within that fruit. And as we said at the start of the year, we know that God's spirit is given to us at the point of our salvation. Um, and it's we've also got that when we get saved there's not all that confusion around oh I need to get this I need to get that and striving all the time Um, where we do need to strive as we know it's and it's not so much that we're striving for it it's something that, that we're actively doing as an outworking of our Christian life is in waging war against our flesh because we know that we've got the new man and the old man I think it was John MacArthur I was listening to his teachings um, this week and again he was saying about how the Apostle Paul used the analogy of if you murdered someone back in Bible times then some punishments where the, the dead body was strapped to your body and you had to walk about with it and eventually it killed you and really that's the picture that the Apostle Paul uses to describe our flesh and our sinful nature and how unfortunately we have to carry it about with us and we won't experience um, the release of that until we're no longer in this earth or unless Jesus decides to just come and we become glorified there and then. And, you know, I just want to encourage some people that I thought it was really interesting when we were away. Um, the teachings was all about the glory of God, but I heard Joel Beakey talk and he's obviously the, an expert, if you like, in the Puritans. And he spoke with great love and compassion about a friend of his. And I think he'd been a friend for something like 50 years. And his wife, who also was a believer, but she really, really struggled with, with her assurance. And sometimes I think we can be quite, maybe hard to judge people and think, oh, you should be dealing with that, you should be over that. And I just thought, wow, there's somebody who's been a believer for like years and years and years and genuinely just struggled with her assurance, knowing that she was saved. Um, and sadly, the lady took on well and she died and straight after she died this friend had phoned Joel Beakey and Joel Beakey they were saying that's her she's away into the glory of God and I mean it was a real kind of like celebration and Joel Beakey was saying to her he said say to um, his friend just imagine your wife knows more than us than we'll ever know about God until we get there and I just thought you know that real humility and sometimes I just think we do struggle with things and you know, I think it's okay, and I think, you know, where Mark's been teaching around the meditation, how if we continue to meditate in God's word, that'll bring change in our lives, but really about our roles and building each other up and supporting each other, and anyway, I just wanted to share that because I think we can be hard on ourselves or hard on others because we think we should be somewhere where we're not always going to be, and sometimes people just struggle with things, and that can just be part and parcel of your walk with God. So um, so as I've been praying and studying about gentleness, for me personally, I've just been really grateful that we're now at this fruit. And it's like everyone you get to, I just think, oh, this is great, like when you get into it. Because I really believe that gentleness as a posture and as a way of living is really um, how women of God, if you like, believers should live their life. I think women should be gentle. I don't think women... Um, should be harsh um, or bullish or you know aggressive. I, I just don't believe that's God's design for us as women. And I think as this fruit 
of God working in our lives. I think gentleness is a real byproduct to that. And it's not just for women, obviously, because gentleness is the same as meekness. Um, and that depends on the translation that you read. And if you'll remember last year, we studied the Beatitudes and we studied meekness, which was probably one of the hardest Beatitudes to really kind of drill down and um, explain. So, I mean, it's not often I'm able to say, well, I've read my notes from last year to actually pick up some things on meekness. So I'm just going to recap on a few things that obviously I'd spoke about last year. And firstly, you would maybe remember what Mark had said about the Beatitudes. He had said that the first three are the foundation of salvation. They are the pillars. And the third, which is meekness, has been the last before a believer moves into healthy desires to be like Christ. So if you've got poor in spirit, then you know that you you need God, that there's nothing you can do for your salvation. Then if you're mourning your sin through godly sorrow and repentance, then you know that the depth of your own depravity. So when it comes to meekness, you're then dealing with that and you know that you're getting ready to move into um, seeing yourself as you truly are, being humble, then you're moving into right desires to serve God. And the reason people don't get the rest of the Beatitudes, this is what it says, right, and continue to fumble and be selfish is because they have scrimped and are not got a true footing on the first three. And if you actually think of that in relation to meditation, I mean, you could probably say, yep, absolutely. How much have I meditated on that? Since how much am I really knowing that as I etched in my heart about my poverty spirit, how I mourn my sin, how I'm humble when you go through the Beatitudes. And it's so true. And I think it is a good reminder, um, obviously, to be meek is to be led and driven by healthy desires and to be like Christ. Um, when you think of the recent teachings at our prayer meetings, you know, meditating God's word, again, thinking about God and his goodness. And I love it always when it comes to these studies and these nights. What we learn as a church just makes it so much easier for us to understand his word. It, it just ties in. Um, and I just think it all comes together and it helps us meditate and more like what Fraser was talking about earlier. Um, I loved what Martin Lloyd-Jones had said about the meek man. He says, they never thinks how wonderful I really am. If only other people gave me a chance, self-pity. What, and I love this and I think, oh my gosh, how true is this? What hours and years we waste in this? That's a scary thought in itself, meditating that. <laughs> But the man who has become meek has finished with all that. To be meek, in other words, means that you have finished with yourself altogether and you have come to see you have no rights or deserts at all, end quote. I mean, that's what Martin Lloyd-Jones said. Um, and if you truly see yourself as you really are, which is real humility, you will gladly operate from a gentle spirit in everything that you do. And I think that's true. You know, we see it worked out in the life of Christ, especially when you consider... The day his death on the cross, which you know is explained in Philippians two, verse five to eight. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross. That's really a meekness and a gentleness. That's someone who's truly humble, you know, not looking to get their own, you know, status, their own, what about this, what about that? And we've heard Mark saying that if he's on the cross, you can imagine Jesus saying, hold on a wee minute. I mean, it's just never going to happen. Um, so gentleness, being gentle and being meek is not being weak. Um, it really is strength and courage to do the God thing, just as Jesus did. You know, that what courage it took Jesus to, to do that. You know, not my will, but yours be done. You know, sweating blood. You know, that, what courage. Um, and that it's true. That's why the world can't understand the depths of Jesus' death. Unless God grants you repentance and opens up your eyes, you have no, you cannot understand it. And if we think of the Pharisees of the day, they could not get their head or comprehend that the God, small g, that they believed in could ever make himself of no reputation. They could not comprehend that. 
coming in the form of a bond servant. Now, you need to remember, they were always on show and it was everything to do with them. Um, they had no idea that it was Jesus who laid down his life through his own humility and obedience to God to die on the cross. They thought it was them, that they were doing the right thing. You know, but I know they weren't even thinking they were doing the right thing because they were too deceitful and too hard-hearted and full of evil um, in what they were doing. But they just, the world just cannot comprehend that. I and mean, when you consider the poverty of your own spirit and your own depravity, your selfishness and self-centeredness, how prideful and haughty you can be, it becomes clear when acting and believing at that, that really we are nothing like Christ and we have no humility or gentleness in our lives. Um, I think as well, if you consider Christianity today, people who are carnally minded, they can't grasp or understand that which is spiritual. It's so hard having a debate with an unbeliever when you're trying to explain to them about God because they don't get it. And I remember having a conversation a number of years ago with my sister-in-law and eventually I'd say to her, listen, I really don't mean this disrespectful because I really didn't mean it disrespectfully. I'm like, you are never going to be able to understand what I'm talking about. You just won't get it because it's a carnal mind and it's an enemy to God. It just can't comprehend the things of God. Um, and then even though we've got God's spirit in us, there's times where we can struggle to discern the things of God because we're not putting off the old man to walk in the new man, the new creation that we've become at the point of our salvation. And therein lies the battle. And that's where I feel the repetition of the teachings is coming in because it's the same battle and we are in a battle. And I know it sounds... I don't know, but I think for years I used to think we're in a battle, you know, like a spiritual battle. But for the moment you open your eyes in the morning until you go to bed, you are in a battle, you know, an absolute battle for your mind, your thoughts, your emotions, your decisions, your will. And we have to take everything, our thoughts captive and we have to bring it into the obedience of Christ. It's, it is that wage, it is a war. I mean, it really, really is. Um, so what does biblical gentleness look like in the context of the fruit of the Spirit for us to be gentle as women? Well, a good question to ask ourselves is, do you consider yourself to be gentle? And I think in order to answer that, we need to be really honest and ask, are we gentle in our dealings with people, problems, trials? Um, or would you consider yourself to be harsh at times, abrasive? bullish even. Um, most of us will know this scripture in 1 Peter 3 verse 3 to 4 when um, he's talking about women and it says that do not let your adornment be merely outward arranging the hair wearing gold or putting on fine apparel rather let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible, incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which is very precious in the sight of God. And Peter's talk there in the context of women and being wives, you know, and you know, in relation to your relationship, not just with your husband, but with other people as well. And for me, it's in the hidden person of the heart that we have to do the work. It's hidden in our hearts. Um, because that's where that's the seat of our thoughts, our emotions, um, that really is your mind. Your mind is your heart. It really is. That's, you know, where everything is. And we know that our heart's deceitful above all things. So that's why we really need to be meditating in God's word so that we can weed out and wage war against the flesh and the lies and the issues that seek to sabotage our lives. Um, and I think many of us, myself included, think at times we can get away with externally looking the part of being gentle by behaving a certain way. Um, meanwhile, there can be a war that's raging inside. Um, and the war isn't necessarily that we are waging war, it's that that's waging war with us. Um, and it can run riot as a result of a belief that we are entitled, you know, for whatever it is that's going on in us, or we're way greater than, you know, we're holding ourselves higher than we ought. We think we're better than we ought thinking of ourselves more highly which is the opposite of humility um 
And in Romans 12, verse 3, it says, For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I mean, again, see if you were just writing that scripture down and that's really what you were choosing to think on and meditate on. It would start changing how you deal with things, how you see things, how you are looking to um, pitch yourself against other people. I'm sure last year I had said when I was looking at my notes, like true humility is not placing people when you see them, how you can place people. True humility is not doing that. And I think that's about thinking yourself more highly than you ought to think. Um, and we need to remind ourselves that Jesus is lowly and gentle in heart. He became of no reputation to die on the cross for us, having done no wrong himself and his life. And I think some of these hidden areas that affect us and affect our walk with God and being able to operate in the fruit of the Spirit, because remember, if we can get we can work on waging war with our issues, God's Spirit's much more free to operate in and through us. Um, it's sometimes can't, God can operate through us because we're too busy to think about ourselves or dealing with ourselves to, to be caring about somebody else or seeing something else. Um, so, you know, some of the areas that can be really rooted for us that we need to be dealing with are related to rejection, um, anger, pride, being self-consumed, being frightened and having a lack of self-control, to name a few. Um, if you are finding that hidden place in your heart, being subject to tensions, you're thinking about them all the time. We know that arguments and every lofty thing that sets, it up, sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We know that that happens. I can't remember what scripture that's in, but we're told to tear them down because then we go past feeling. And when we go past feeling, then all hell can break loose. So we know that we've got arguments and every lofty thing that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Um, and if you've got all that going on, then you know you're not operating in the fruity spirit in gentleness. Um, if we're to wage war against our flesh so that the incorruptible spirit of God is incorruptible, it's pure. God's spirit is so pure that there's nothing can corrupt it. How amazing is that? Like, nothing can corrupt God's spirit. It's totally incorruptible. Um, then that can start producing fruit in our lives um, because it's through God's sanctification. And I keep mentioning about meditation as much for myself as for yourselves because I'm convicted by it and I really want to be meditating much more in God's word because I do want to keep changing. Um, so if we look at some of these issues that could be rooted um, and causing us trouble, if you like, um, in the context of gentleness, if we think about rejection, if you've got a fear of rejection going on, you have to ask yourself, where is that fear of rejection coming from? And we know from the teachings that we've had over the years in this church that the fear of rejection is rooted in our lack of security. That's what it's rooted in. You're not secure because you've got a fear of rejection. And that might be that you're not secure financially, relationally, which in turn affects your peace because we know peace is related to security. Whereas if you think about the opposite of rejection, it is security. So if you are at, if you ask yourself when you're close to Christ, when you're really close to Christ, when you're praying, you're worshiping, you're studying God's word, you feel as though you could just float away and you want Jesus to come and take you there. And then um, you'll know at those moments you're dead secure. You feel dead secure. And I know it's not about feelings, but you're secure because you're dominated by God and what he says and you, you're not worried about things the same you're not frightened of things the same because his words got a louder voice in your heart and in your mind and your stuff that you've got going on um and if we think of um anger the opposite of anger is peace um peace like security leads to gentleness um Again, when you consider when you are at peace as a person, you'll always be much more gentle in how you're living your life. Think about it. See, when you're at peace, people don't annoy you the same. You're not reacting. Um, you're not mouthing off. And it's so easy just to get to do all these things. And 
you know, sometimes because we don't live deliberate, it's out. I was at a training course yesterday and I ended up, I'm like, oh, this happened and that was terrible, blah, 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 blah. I'm just thinking, honestly, just zip, zip it. You know, but before you know it, you can, then it can be harsh and it's it's not nice. Um, so when you're really at peace and you're not angry, then you, you don't have those reactions most often than not you actually probably just want to say anything anyway because you're at peace you're like ah being gentle you know you've got that self-control that goes on inside um if you think you're having pride in the opposite of pride the opposite of pride is humility so humility really is one of the main parts of gentleness as we know um as i've touched on earlier through being meek it's about really seeing yourself in the light of who Christ is and not having too high an opinion of yourself. So if you're humil if you're humble, then again a byproduct to living a humble life is being gentle. Um selfishness, the opposite of selfishness is selflessness. Selflessness is also a byproduct, an attribute of gentleness, where you're gentle and lowly in heart because you're not all about you, it's about other people. Also, with fear, the opposite of fear is faith. Um, when you're faithful, as we know through the other sp- fruit of the Spirit, um, and if you consider meditating God's Word, it always breeds within you faith, which will also then produce as a byproduct gentleness. So, what you're seeing really is um, all these other fruits and fruit, sorry, in your life through God's Spirit is the opposite of what going on inside you your carnal flesh and there is an antidote for it we just need to wage that war and i'm beating that drum wage war remember like the picture um not to be that stiff-necked person waging war so that you start to bear the fruit of gentleness um and if you think of people that you've maybe met in your life and they just have a spirit of gentleness about them you know there may be um, you know, someone who's maybe achieved a lot, but they wouldn't have a high opinion of yourself. I remember Mark talking about when he met John MacArthur, you know, how like John MacArthur, who's obviously, you know, needs no introduction, but how someone like a John MacArthur would make Mark or someone else feel so at ease, feel so welcome, be very interested in them as a person. They don't feel they need to tell them things or, you know, Mark was talking about that last night. He doesn't feel the need to just want to encourage people. That's a gentleness. That's a humility. That's a seeing other people. And I think um, that becomes the fruit that you actually see in people's life. You wouldn't necessarily always identify that that's someone with a gentle spirit, but really it is because it's a humble spirit. It's a spirit that is, you know, measured by self-control as well. Um, but it, they're really selfless. And when I spoke earlier about the Beatitudes, it really does make perfect sense that it's your heart attitude that stops you from living for Christ or for yourself. Whereas if you have got a humble, meek heart, you know, bearing that fruit of gentleness, that spirit, God's spirit in you, then creates the right desires for you to live for Christ in his ways. I hope that can make sense. Um, but I also want to say that I know that some things aren't always as straightforward as that. You can't always talk a message and just say you're selfish, you've got rejection issues, you've got fear issues and you've got this and you need to deal with it. Do you know, sometimes it's not as straightforward as that. You know, sometimes like that woman, that Joe Beakey, like that lady, for whatever reason in her life, just genuinely really struggled with that. And that was just something that, you know, periodically in her life she had to she had to deal with. Um, and sometimes it can be difficult dealing with situations because as people you can end up injured through situations, maybe things not being right in your life, if it's whether it's persecution, abuse or real rejection, where people do actually just reject you. Um, And Jonathan Edwards says that we can be injuries by being meek. So this is another reason why God's spirit in us, the fruit of his spirit helps us overcome, helps us be more like Christ. I mean, look what Jesus overcame. 
you know, just through all the hatred that was thrown at him. Um, and it's not that we're suffering that's the problem, it's how we deal with it and carry it, um, the sufferings that we have. When we carry things well, it's a direct result from the fruit of gentleness because you're not allowing your heart to become hardened. You're gentle, you're remaining gentle because you're carrying it, it's the way you're carrying it. Um, we don't always need to agree about things, we might even need to challenge some things, but when you're doing that, you're doing it with the right spirit. You're doing it with a spirit of gentleness, you're not shouting and mauling like a crazy person, you know, so you're not being harsh, you're, it's in that spirit of Christ. Um, and being able to do that isn't just evidence of having self-control and being long-suffering, um, but also a gentleness, and that really is the fruit of the Spirit. And you can see it in different scenarios in your life. Um, Jonathan Edwards also says of people who can bear injury, injuries with a quietness, and I think of the quietness uh, that Peter talks for women, you should have a gentle and quiet spirit. You know, gentleness allows a person to bear ills with a quiet spirit, because in that injury or ill, the sufferer is looking to improve themselves. They're not out for revenge. They're using the trials, they're using the struggles, they're using the situation to say, right, how can I become more like Christ in this situation? And that's not to say that it's easy, that it's right, that you deserve it. You know, we live in a broken world with sinful people, um, but it's how we carry things, what we bear, that through God's fruit and through his spirit that helps us become more like Christ um, and if you think about it and I see it often and I'm <laughs> sure you do as well like vengeful people that are harsh and they're crass um, and it's the opposite of gentleness um, whereas that poison composure you see in people when offence comes to their life and it just doesn't it just I'm not saying it always bounces off but they deal with it in a way that it's a, through a gentleness in their spirit. Um, and remember, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And that's really the strength that God can give us through his spirit that each and every one is have got. And it's that quiet focus and being like Christ during all your trials. Um, it's considering that and how you imitate him and how you're looking to Christ. And through that, that's what dissipates bad fruit in your life. It dissipates you wanting revenge. Because see, when you're living like that, it just destroys you. It, it, it doesn't bring you any peace. You know what I mean? It's not going to produce bad fruit, won't produce good fruit. I mean, it's just not going to happen. A bad reaction is not going to produce a good reaction. It, it just doesn't work like that. Our goal is to become like Christ. And, and it's not always easy. So, um, again, then we have to be aware of these things, and I think we have to have compassion in each other with these things for people's lives. And again, that just is really off the back of what Mark's been talking about um, in terms of, you know, abiding with each other and building each other up. Um, Mark mentioned last night um, a scripture from John's Gospel, chapter 15, 1 to 5, where Jesus says that he's the true vine. And my father is a vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If you're abiding in him, you won't be worried about rejection, fear and anger. Why? Because, as it says in Hebrews 13, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things if you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And that's an amazing scripture to meditate on if you're feeling fearful. That really is, um, because God's word's true and it's living and it's alive and it's who God is. It's God breathed, it's God's word, it is God. Um, and as women, we do compare ourselves way, way too much. 
to each other um, and it can cause us to bear too much bad fruit which does make us harsh there's nothing worse than seeing a harsh spirit within a woman i think it's a real ugly thing to see in a woman it's it's not nice it's truly a, ungodly and any true spiritual person can see that it's rooted in self it really is um, and as i said earlier that's not a cast of judgment i know it can be hard and we might think at times we're never going to get over things or we're not changing enough. But as Mark said on Sunday, it's not about being full of knowledge, which is pride. But as sisters in Christ, we are to edify one another and help build one another up. Um, we are not to bring correction. This is what he was saying is with my notes. We are not to bring correction without compassion. And that is so true. And I loved what he said on Sunday, and I wrote this down as well. Knowledge never carries the heart of others, always your own. How true is that? It always does carry your own heart, never somebody else's. Um, so we do need to bear with each other, and it's people with a gentle spirit that bears well with others. And if we're abiding in the Lord, he will prune that bad fruit from our lives that we continue to bear much fruit. If that wasn't the case, he wouldn't have said it. Jesus wouldn't have said that if that wasn't the case. Um, so as we know... Um, Spending time with God will, through meditating on his word, allow him to cut the bad fruit in your life. That's what he will do. He will cut it. That's a promise from God. And abiding in that causes us to want to be like Christ. And the more time we spend with him, the more we are like him. And then through that, we take on the form of a bond servant, become people of no reputation like, like Christ. And when I think about the gentleness of God, I always consider the scripture and it's just a go-to scripture for me. I just love it. And if I'm ever feeling heavy in life or struggling or lacking peace or whatever, I always go to the scripture. And it's in Matthew 11, verse 20 to 30. And it's Jesus talking, saying, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I, that just refreshes me, that scripture. And if I think of people who aren't saved and I know they're carrying stuff, I think, oh, Jesus, that come, he wants to take. You just want to say to people, see that burden you're carrying, you were never meant to carry. That pain, that rejection, that fear, that need for revenge, unforgiveness, but whatever it is, come and heal. Let go to him. I just love it. Um, and everything about that scripture highlights to me gentleness. I, I picture in my mind the secure who he is, stable yet gentle, lowly and loving, strong saviour who calls us to himself. And he asks us to go to him with all our burdens and our fears and our worries. But no, he doesn't tell us just to leave them there. He asks us to take his yoke upon ourselves and asks us to learn from him stating that he is gentle and lowly in heart and we will find rest for our souls. We are promised that he then gives us an easy yoke and a light burden. Jesus is a carrier of people's burdens. He is gentle. He is lowly in heart. Um, there is no pride or deceit in him. It says in 1 Peter 2, 21-24, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revel in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you, have, you were healed. And again, you just see it everywhere in Scripture, and you just think, that's how I need to live. That's that's the, what Jesus is saying to me. That's the yoke I want you to take this is what I want you to learn from me then you will find rest and peace for your soul um so we need to know the saviour and I think hey, young ones in here that don't know Christ you need we need to know the saviour you need to know the saviour you need to get saved you need to know that he graciously gives us his righteousness so that we can have access to God the Father as we know and we've been learning that we've got a prayer here in God we have been given direct access to the throne room of God, the Father himself. And Dr. Ian Hamilton said as believers when we were in Newcastle, we really should be acquainted with our privileges and mercies in the gospel. We should be acquainted with that. We should know that. 
That is a privilege and it is a mercy in the gospel. And it's one of our great privileges and it's extended to us through our salvation. And then Jesus tells us we're to learn from him. He's a great teacher telling us that he is gentle and he's low in heart. And if we do learn from him, we will find rest for our souls. What a promise. What a promise. As it says in 2 Peter 1, 3, his divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. It's explicit in this scripture and in our teaching and meekness that gentleness truly is humility and lowliness of self, or in other words, selflessness. That is who Jesus, that is who Jesus is. So what does it mean for us to learn from him? Well, Jesus tells us that he's gentle and lowly in heart. And in John 13, 15, he says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. That's the scripture that comes after Jesus washing his disciples' feet before he was going to be um, betrayed. And just taking you back to what Martin Lloyd-Jones says, imagine um, Jesus, which I know you just can't, saying, how wonderful I really am. If only other people gave me a chance. You know, like I've come down from heaven. I'm the God. I created everything. I could just fly you away, walk <laughs> through the walls. I could do all this. Imagine Jesus being so consumed with who he really was. Um, and it, it, it's just totally on Christ like yet yeah, this is how people live and I love what he said what hours and years we waste in this you know just as an aside I'm always grateful when I read something I love reading stuff like that because I know more mind and I know more thoughts um but people never ever talk about it people never ever talk about their own self-consumption and what they consume think about themselves that they're better than what they are that they're looking for glory or they're looking to be worshipped or they're looking for praise or looking for acceptance and what fanciful thoughts that that can take you down a road. And I love that Martin Lloyd-Jones says, what hours and years we waste in this, we waste in this, which tells me as a man of God that that's something that he's had to battle with in his own life. Um, and I just think, you know, we're in good company, you know, and we have got this amazing saviour um, and God that loves us, not to keep us, you know, where we're at. Um, but it also means being gentle, means living at the standard set by Christ. You know, we're called to what community, as it says in Ephesians 4, 1 to 5, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness, there it is again, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love endeavouring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Really, that is the picture of the fruit of the spirit in operation. Um, and there are, you know, they're just two scriptures, but there's many, many scriptures where we could read about and learn from Jesus, but what it means to take on his yoke and follow his ways. And I know it does seem like a really tall order. It does, um, you know, if you consider though the works of your flesh and the pain that that brings you and the struggles that you have and the angst and the worry and the fear and all the stuff that goes with it, compared to how you are when you meditate in God's word and you're really pursuing Christ and you're, waging war with your flesh, there really is no comparison. You know, John MacArthur, um, it was a teaching, they were talking about, and I've heard it before, it was a woman, Joy, was like struggling with whether she was a believer or not. And he was asking her all these questions. It was a QA and a session. And he, he says, I mean, do you want to know Christ? Do you do you want to do this? She's like, yeah, but I mean, I can't do it more strength. And he, strength. And he says, well, join the club. You know what I mean? And we can't, we can't do it in our own strength. Um, but what we can do is we can do the bits that we need to do to allow God to do the bits that only he can do. So we close um, in John MacArthur's commentary. Um, he sums up gentlemanness and what he says is, there's the Greek word 
Praoutis is used to describe the three attitudes when discussing gentleness, and this is in the New Testament. Submissiveness to the will of God, teachableness and consideration of others. And he quotes and says, Although he was God, while he lived on earth as a son of man, Jesus was gentle and humble in heart. Like their Lord, believers are to actively pursue meekness and gentleness and to wear them like a garment. And he goes on to quote Colossians 3 verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness and long-suffering. And again, it's just all wrapped up. And that's the instruction that we have as women. Um, so I hope that was a whistle-stop tour through really, I think, what it it's like or how we should be living a humble life because ultimately that's truly what gentleness is and in your humility you've got strength because if you truly know who you are in Christ and you're following Christ and you're in that place it doesn't matter what people say about you it doesn't matter you know what's happening in your life your security and peace is in Christ and really see when the chips are down when your health is failing when things are going wrong in your life or you could lose your job or your, or what, anything could happen, see really your security is in Christ because really that's all that matters. And you only know that until things happen in your life when you really know that. And that's true humility. When you know that without Christ you're nothing, you can't even breathe without God. So in terms of like homework, just so you know, it's just really going over those quote for John MacArthur and where you need to consider those three areas for your life and linking it into that scripture in Colossians but I hope and pray that that's been helpful and I hope that it's you know come across as compassionate about our struggles and how we need to you know really pursue God we really need to pursue God and I know we see it but oh, I just think all the it's mind-numbing, wasteful thoughts and things that you can do <laughs> in life that really could be much better spent. You know, time flies. You, the older you get, the quicker it goes. That's true. I hate to say it, but it's true. So anyway, we'll just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your precious word. And we thank you, Lord, for your example and um, the yoke and the burden that you that you want to put on us, Lord. It's not as the world gives us burdens or our sin brings us into bondage, but it's a burden of joy in following after you, putting into place the works that you're asking us to do through denying ourselves and our selfish ambition, cap taking your thoughts captive and bring them into the obedience of your, your word, Lord, and your will. And I just ask, Lord, for us all here as women, for those who don't know you, Lord, I pray in your everlasting mercy and kindness that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would be saved and they would come to know you as their Lord and Saviour. And ask, Lord, for each and every one of us as we battle, and sometimes it is a battle, as we endeavour to bring glory to you in our lives, that you would give us grace upon grace, that we would know the riches of your glory and you would help us, Lord, to wage war on our sin so that your fruit and your spirit, that you would cut off the branches that aren't bearing fruit so that we would bear much fruit, much more fruit, Lord, for your glory. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.